We know that dark matter exists. It's five times more abundant than regular visible matter that we are familiar with. So this planet, the stars, this is just one fifth of the total matter in the universe. Plus there is also such a thing like dark energy, which we don't understand at all. We just know it's there. <laughs> what I'm mostly interested in is, uh, let's say, the easier of the two problems, the dark matter question. <laughs> dark energy is really quite difficult even to frame properly. So yeah, this is, uh, this is what we are doing with, uh, with my research group. Welcome to People Doing Physics, the podcast that explores the personal side of physics at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Hi, I'm Vanessa Bismuth, I work in the Communications Office at the Cavendish. And I'm Jacob Butler from the Outreach Office here. This month on People Doing Physics, we're delighted to welcome Oleg Brandt, a professor of experimental physics in the High Energy Physics Group of the Cavendish. Oleg's journey into the world of particle physics is both captivating and enlightening. From his early days, inspired by a remarkable physics teacher directly followed by a rocky start at university, to a transformative experience abroad and a few more pivotal moments along the way, Oleg's insatiable curiosity for the fundamental mysteries of physics and his passion for teaching has led him to Cambridge, where he now teaches the next generation of physicists while searching for dark matter, long live particles and other exciting new phenomena at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. In this episode, Oleg offers a glimpse into the intricate world of particle physics through his unique perspective. Together we talk about the fulfilment and frustrations of a life in research, the importance of feeding one's curiosity, navigating setbacks, and advice for aspiring physicists. Stay with us. So welcome, Oleg, and thank you thank for you. being yeah, with us thanks today. Thanks for having me, yeah. Um, as you're joining this podcast, let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your journey into physics? What sparked your initial interest and how did you navigate your path through university? Oh, uh, yeah, how did it start? I think it started quite naturally by me being interested in uh, nature and sciences in general. So that was uh, chemistry, biology, physics, of course, as well. Uh, mathematics as, as it is a supportive discipline for all of that so this was kind of on my plate of uh, interests um, and actually initially um, I was quite confident that I want to do chemistry <laughs> so this was about year 10 and we had a fantastic chemistry teacher who was really explaining things why they're happening this way etc etc but at some point um, I think this was the transition between inorganic uh, chemistry where everything is following certain laws to organic uh, chemistry where there's lots of uh, hand waving involved uh, that I realized it's actually the physics that I like about chemistry and of course the teacher himself. So when uh, transitioning to uh, sixth form in Germany that would have been year 11, 12 and 13 uh, my interests then quite naturally shifted uh, towards physics and uh, an important factor in this was uh, my physics teacher. So um, we had five hours of physics, but that was a, select, uh, a, a selected subject or um, subject of, uh, um, inten um, of more intense studies than, uh, than it would be otherwise. Uh, so five hours per week um, with a teacher really to shape you quite a lot potentially. Mm. And uh, this teacher was really quite surprising because it was, I think, one of the first female physics teachers. Um, in Germany, yeah? You in, in, in Germany. In I, mean, Germany. Uh, yeah. I mean, this was already a few decades back and uh, she was close to retirement. In fact, we were the, the last year of, uh, of the students that uh, she would teach. Um, so she had a long career behind her. Uh, she's seen many, many students, but also uh, because uh, she was one of the first female physicists. She presumably, at least this is what I gather from her stories, had to overcome a lot of difficulties uh, in, in her career, which she mastered quite uh, superbly. But also this gave her a certain attitude to life, which uh, was quite inspiring to us. Mm -hmm. And this was not only for physics itself, but also uh, related to um, the general attitude to life, so certain, let's say, philosophical outlook at life. And uh, um, I mean, for example, she would always follow a very rational approach, even to 
politics, which, as you know, <laughs> is not always rationality driven. <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed having political discussions as as an aside in the physics lesson. That's uh, quite remarkable, I think. And uh, she would very sharply dissect uh, any um, ongoing public debate, especially when it came uh, to, let's say, environmental aspects and uh, provide her um, always well-argued and rational perspective, which was just astonishing to us because that's not necessarily how political debates are led. Mm. <laughs> you were also saying that you, she was integrating some fresh physics and like looking at like recent publications, so going aside the curriculum a little bit. That Absolutely, um, which is also quite surprising, uh, given that uh, that was a teacher who was close to retirement. But no, uh, she really went uh, uh, with the pace of time. And of course, she also got through the usual curriculum that she had to do um, to follow. Uh, but there was also, let's say, a non negligible amount of time for just Having fun, yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> one of uh, so, so, so there were some experiments uh, involved that normally would not not necessarily be done as part of the lesson. So that was optional, but we liked it. So she was happy to to give this opportunity to us. Um, so I still remember how we had to measure the speed of light with a laser beam and a drill, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was rotating. So essentially, you were measuring uh, the speed of light from the um, little change uh, in in the direction of the mirror as uh, the light uh, of the of the laser bounced uh, from the mirror to another mirror and back and of course you had to tune the drill to have exactly the right frequency <laughs> with a tuning fork <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> which was the biggest challenge for me because i'm not really uh, i don't really have a musical ear but it was good fun <laughs> and from that you were you were hooked on physics and absolutely. that was it that, absolutely. that did there the was, job there was there was no way back um, well, with some minor setbacks, perhaps in the future, which I can talk about <laughs> uh, a bit later. But yeah, this 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 was it. Um, yeah. Perhaps one additional uh, comment. Um, I, I shouldn't generate um, the impression that it was uh, all easy going, mm -hmm. all just fun. It was it was fun. Uh, however, it was by far not easy going. So she was actually <laughs> quite a demanding teacher. So. Uh, by talking to my peers later at university, I realized that we had to do some things that would be expected perhaps in first or second year of university, like error calculus, like <laughs> propagation of uncertainties. So we had to do this already at school, which we didn't know we, we don't have to do, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a very interesting challenge. It certainly helped you hit the ground running, I hope, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So course. you mentioned in our chat earlier that your time at the University of Bonn for your undergraduate had few challenges. Can you talk about some of these challenges and how they shaped the rest of your journey at university? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the challenges was actually not so much uh, the university, but rather the fact that uh, at this time military service of about a year, so 10 months, was still compulsory in Germany which is very effective at wiping your brains <laughs> <laughs> after school. Um, so, yeah. And, and in addition to this, I had this, what I thought was a very smart idea of putting all my vacations at the end of the military service and just start studying in the spring term. So not losing one entire year because of military service, but just one, uh, one term. Um, yeah, and uh, I thought this was fantastic. Um, however, what we then, well, I was not the only one who, who made this experience. We were about uh, 20 people in the same boat. We realized that the university uh, physics provision doesn't really cater to people starting in the spring term. So we missed out uh, on one full term of teaching, which uh, especially in the mathematical side was uh, quite fundamental for really pursuing the following studies and uh, yeah. so you had to do a lot of catch up a lot of catch up yeah. and uh, some of that was uh, really quite challenging so but at some point i was uh, i was even tempted to apply uh, with Lufthansa to become a professional pilot <laughs> just because I thought I've had enough of physics and I don't want to do it luckily they didn't take me because of uh, uh, my vision was borderline so in the end, uh, I decided to just you know, stay with physics with this one uh, for this one term. And in the end of it, uh, I realized, OK, it's getting better. And so I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is there anything in particular that helped you to persist through those tricky parts? Or? 
um, Power Three. Well, I think this uh, this start in um, uh, in the spring term, this unusual start with twenty other chaps um, and ladies, uh, was uh, very formative experience not only because it was a challenge but also because you were in the same boat with other people and you made uh, the you went through the same difficult experiences which is really great for bonding so <laughs> to some of the people from uh, who started together with me I still talk today so to, this really created a very strong bond and provided a strong motivation uh, besides this of course the subject was exciting I really loved the physics um, and also the mathematics we had a fantastic uh, a math professor who just recently won a Leibniz Prize. That's one of the biggest prizes you can get in math. And uh, yeah, he was also <laughs> extremely challenging and extremely demanding, but uh, it was all it was all worth it. Ah, a good challenge. So you mentioned that you were first interested in theoretical physics and pursuing particularly the theory of condensed matter as a topic. But uh, you mentioned, I think, what an encounter with a particular professor made you go another way. Do you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about this? Yeah. Um, well, I think the... Um, I would like to preface this um, this discussion with a little, uh, let's say, subtitle, <laughs> which is uh, just follow your interests and, and have fun. Um, so first I was convinced that I wanted to do theoretical physics and condensed matter, as, uh, as you correctly pointed out. Um, however, I had then, uh, let's say, um, a funny experience where I discovered that uh, if I wanted to do uh, theoretical physics of condensed matter, I would have to switch universities. <laughs> so there was a personal compatibility between uh, uh, the lecturer or the, the, the PI of, of this particular group and myself. So uh, it, it all started with uh, me following the, the lecture which was given by this professor. And um, at the end of the lecture, we had oral exams. And um, yeah. Not my first exam experience, uh, however, that, that time it went uh, really funny. So um, I didn't get a very good grade. Um, and so I asked the professor, what, what happened? Um, and what happened from my perspective is that one of the questions uh, that I was asked was to write down the mathematical formalism for superconductivity in a metal. So this is the so-called Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieper, um, Hamiltonian. and. Um, yeah, I didn't write it down by, by heart, but I rather wrote down the individual terms, uh, trying to argue and reason what each of the individual terms is supposed to represent in terms of physics, trying to give it uh, an intuition, and essentially I had the full Hamiltonian written down, but uh, after some discussion. Now, the professor didn't like it. <laughs> His statement was, I would have expected you to write this down, uh, to, to write down the entire uh, uh, BCS uh, Hamiltonian one go. And I thought, okay, uh, that's perhaps not for me, because as a physicist, you're supposed to understand what you're doing, have an intuition about it, and that's just, you know, learning by heart. That's not me. That's not physics. So I decided I want to do something else. Um, yeah, since I didn't know what to do, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You take a break. Hmm. So I took an academic break, which was taking a, an Erasmus semester, which brought me to the University of Amsterdam. Um, so I had six months there, which was... Um, the point where I finally fell in love uh, with particle physics. I was interested in particle physics already before, simply because it's a fundamental science and you really um, appreciate that you're dealing with fundamental blocks of matter. The, the fascinating thought about particle physics is that in principle you can deduce all the phenomena that we observe around us, so including chemistry, biology, etc., etc. Et all of this can be traced back to very basic equations that govern fundamental particle physics. So that idea was fascinating me since I started university, but um, the moment where I, re where I decided that uh, this is the type of physics I want to do research in, I want to do my um, final undergraduate uh, one-year research project with, that was at the University of Amsterdam. So I started there. I was also following courses at uh, uh, the National um, uh, Laboratory for Particle Physics of Netherlands, the equivalent of Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK. And I realized, oh, out of the six lectures I follow, four of them are on particle physics. So this is what you should be doing. <laughs> and so this is how it came about. I mean, at the point where I decided that I want to do particle physics, it was clear that there were, I mean, the options were just uh, one of the uh, three uh, uh, working groups uh, which were doing particle physics mm -hmm. in Bonn. 
and uh, so I went around shopping, trying to see what, uh, what I could do. And I was just simply lucky. So the first professor I went to, and I introduced myself, and you know, I showed him my CV, etc., etc. And uh, he said, well, great. Would you like to go to Fermilab in, uh, in Chicago, in the US, for, for a year? Um, to which I replied, yes, I'd love to, but uh, the, there is the question of funding, yeah? And uh, he said, no, no, don't worry, we'll take care of that. <laughs> so apparently, um, uh, they just received a grant, which was, uh, and then some amount was uh, left over, which is precisely to fund a master student uh, to go to Fermilab. And so this is how I ended up spending uh, almost all of my master thesis, which is uh, 12 months nominally in Germany, so 10 and a half months of them. I spent at Chicago and Fermilab, which was a very interesting experience because uh, you're really then getting a unique chance to not only experience a different country, a different culture, uh, but also to see many more uh, additional cultures because uh, the, the zero uh, collaboration that uh, I was uh, I was part of uh, for this uh, for this research uh, was um, yeah that was about 750 people at this time. Uh, that had people from all around the world. So we had people from, uh, of course, a lot of people from Europe, from the US, uh, but then of course people also from uh, uh, South America or China or Japan, Far East, mm. um, Australians. So yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was uh, quite exciting. So I also realized that it's, uh, yeah, one of the one of the things that draws me to particle physics is also social aspect because uh, you just get to know so many people. Well, mm. still, despite all these cultural differences, I'm interested in the same one thing, particle physics, and <laughs> are working on the same, let's say, set of common goals. Mm. And so your experience at the Fermilab is, seems to be pivotal. Um, and can you tell us about how or if that has impact, had an impact on the rest of your, like your next career choices? <laughs> well, um, certainly did uh, have impact and an, a, a strong impact because um, when I started my master thesis I wasn't quite sure whether I want to continue with an academic career so I was uh, wondering okay is that what you want to do perhaps uh, I, I was also eyeing a career in industry which uh, of course as I already was aware back then pays much better than uh, <laughs> than academia mm -hmm. And uh, I even followed a special workshop which was organized by uh, my scholarship. So that was essentially um, a headhunting event organized by the Boston Consulting Group where they flew us in, all, uh, all people who received this kind of scholarship from, from Germany that in the US at this time to a nice four-star hotel in Florida, hmm. uh, paying everything, including the flights. Um, so yeah, I was certainly having a, a look um, a lookout um, for other opportunities and keeping the back door open. But then in the end, uh, when it came to, let's say, the middle of uh, the master thesis, where it was time to apply for PhDs and all of that, um, I just said to myself, OK, you really quite like doing research. yeah. And if you go to earn big money right now, you will never know what you would have missed had you done a PhD. Mm. And so I stayed on and I applied for PhDs. And by the way, the same thing happened also when I was close to submitting my PhD and I was looking for you know, how to do the next step. So the same, the same thing happened to me again. I was uh, wondering, do I want to have an academic career? Do I want to be a postdoctoral research assistant? Um, is it worth it or not? And I thought, okay, now you've got a taste as, uh, of how real research is like as a PhD student. So now as a, as a postdoctoral uh, research assistant, you have way more freedom. So you really see <laughs> how it really is to direct your own research, which by the way, turned out to, not to be quite true because <laughs> still you, you are employed by a PI who kind of determines uh, the basic direction of research, but still you have way more freedom. And then I thought, okay, if you don't do now a postdoc, uh, a postdoc um, you will not know what you missed out on. So this is how I ended up doing my postdoc. <laughs> led, led by curiosity all the way. Interesting. So, and fun. And yeah, I think, I think having fun in, in physics or in general, mm. in, in research is very, very important. We'll get back to that. Of course, <laughs> please. <laughs> so uh, talking about your PhD, uh, you did at Oxford, didn't you? And was there anything in particular that drew you there into the Atlas experiment? Uh, yes, of course. So as, as we already mentioned, uh, for my master thesis, I was um, at the Tevatron. So we were studying 
um, the top quark, which was uh, quite exciting because the Tevatron Accelerator was the only place on this planet where top quarks could be produced. And I had the exciting opportunity to do this as uh, to do this kind of cutting edge science already during my masters. And already at this time I uh, realized, okay, I love uh, operating detectors, uh, monitoring data taking, and of course I love uh, analyzing the data that come out of detectors. And this was 2006 and the LHC was supposed to turn on in 2007. So I was looking for a PhD position where I would be able to switch over to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and to be the first one, well, among <laughs> many other people of course, to analyze uh, the first data from the Large Hadron Collider recorded with the ATLAS experiment. So I was looking at different opportunities and one of them was, uh, was then Oxford. And one thing that particularly drew me to uh, Oxford and the UK is that uh, um, as part of the PhD program um, it was provisioning a stay of one year at the laboratory where you actually do your research. So that meant for me one year at CERN, mm. which I did during my second year of PhD. In fact, I was even stayed for 14 months, not just 12. And that was really an exciting experience, which I didn't want to miss. I, I mean, I already knew it like, uh, before starting the PhD that I really want to go to CERN for a year. And so it was quite a natural choice. And of course, Oxford has a nice reputation. Um, and uh, plus, um, mentoring played a role because uh, one of the postdocs who was supervising me during my master at Fermilab, he did his PhD in Oxford. And it was, in fact, his suggestion to, to try my luck and to apply with Oxford, which in the end was turned out to be successful. <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned in our earlier chat that you had a, a bit of an incident during your time at the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah. Well, not you, but the LHC. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the Large Hadron Sorry. Collider, yes. <laughs> no, this was, this was actually uh, an unlucky coincidence because, uh, as I mentioned, I came to, um, to the LHC precisely to analyze its first data. And uh, the first part of my PhD was uh, uh, studying simulated data in order to, to get everything, all the ducks in a row from when real data from the LHC would start coming in. But then, uh, bang, uh, literally, bang, <laughs> <laughs> um, an accident has happened. And um, uh, this was when uh, the LHC was uh, started for the first time. Um, a faulty um, superconductive, well, supposedly superconductive uh, uh, connection uh, was faulty and uh, for well within a split second it became non-superconductive while being driven by the full current of uh, <laughs> of the LHC magnets so yeah this this part of the magnets the two ends just evaporated the rest of uh, the surrounding magnets were just pushed away uh, by the shock wave so 30 uh, 30 of the magnets were ripped away from the steel anchoring in the floor and each of those magnets weighs about 40 tons. So you can imagine uh, the magnitude of this. So there was no data taking during... Yeah. Uh, With that, your PhD also evaporated. <laughs> no, not quite. So there was, a, there was a fallback plan which was to study re and analyze real data from cosmic rays, which were then used to... Um, uh, commission the tracking detectors of Atlas, so that was still useful, and it's the second part of my PhD thesis. But uh, yeah, not quite the way <laughs> I imagined it from the beginning. But that was quite a major setback for you. I I, I imagine in your second year of PhD, where you think, well, I'm going to analyze all these real data, and then suddenly you have to rethink the whole project. Well, that's that's fine, but <laughs> well, it, it, it was clear the the Large Hadron Collider would start at some point. Mm. But I also thought, okay, I now want for my postdoc, I want to analyze some real collision data, not just simulations. And so I took the logical decision to actually return to the Tevatron, to return to the D0 collaboration as a postdoc, and um, to continue what I already started earlier for my master's, namely to study uh, the most massive particle that we know today, the most massive fundamental particle, I should say, the top quark. So then I took this decision and I applied for uh, positions. And uh, again, incidentally, uh, uh, my mentor for my master's at that time became a professor and he was looking for people to, <laughs> to assemble his new group in, at the University of Göttingen. And so I joined him. So I was uh, headhunted directly out of, uh, of my PhD and I returned back to the, to the, to the Tevatron. So yeah, that actually leads us nicely to my next question, which was about your your postdocs and your um, 
position um, at Göttingen and then um, after that in Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you also started building your interest in teaching. Um, yes, that's correct. Could you, could you tell us a bit about those, those experiences and, and like your first step into teaching? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the very first step for, uh, into teaching uh, for me happened already during my undergraduate studies. Uh, you see, I was um, quite keen to support myself financially and to finance my studies by myself. So I was working two days per week in a museum for, um, uh, for calculus or uh, calculation aids. It's uh, called the Adequium in Bonn. So I was working as a tour guide and when you work as a tour guide, you're pretty much giving a lecture mm. for one and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> on, on calculus. On, on, uh, on how to use uh, calculation machines or how they were used starting from, you know, old China, Japan, uh, India, Arabic numbers, then over to the first calculating machine from uh, Blaise Pascal, from the first, let's say, real calculating machine over to modern computers. Uh, so that was uh, perhaps the first uh, um, spark of interest. Teaching in physics, that uh, became really a big thing in, I mean, for me in, in Göttingen, because as a, uh, as a postdoctoral research assistant, um, you get uh, the odd chance to actually teach yourself. Of course, you still teach predefined courses, which have to follow a certain syllab syllabus, a certain curriculum, uh, but um, I was given the opportunity to replace the professors who were giving the lectures on a couple of occasions. And um, also I was running the, um, the problem set uh, discussions for several courses, among them uh, the electromagnetism course, which I fell in love with back then. I still teach this uh, course now mm. as, as a professor myself here in Cambridge. And I realized that uh, even though teaching takes a gigantic impact on your time, on your resources. I mean, you're employed essentially to research and then teaching is everything that kind of comes on, on, on top of that, that you can, uh, yeah, that you can do or perhaps not. But I, I realized I like teaching so much that I don't want to miss it. And so I decided this was the point when I decided that I want to, if I want to have a career in uh, academia, I would rather do it at university rather than at the laboratory like CERN where uh, teaching would be very limited. So yeah, this is, uh, mm. <laughs> this is how this part uh, came about. And yeah, the, the more, um, yeah, the, as, as the years went by, I just realized, okay, that's, that's really something that uh, makes you yeah, more complete as a researcher because I think part of our mission is really to pass on the, law, uh, the knowledge to the next generations and not only to pass the knowledge but also to pass on the excitement for physics mm. and uh, yeah, to try to instill it into, into the next generation. Yeah, which is crucial, isn't it? Indeed. It's yeah. a huge impact that a good teacher will have, just as, as you mentioned, and my experiences as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> the introduction to, um, to my script on... Um, uh, for, for the electromagnetism lecture, read something along the lines to dedicate it to everyone who continues playing after entering their adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> but not too much. You've got to get your homework done as well. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to your second postdoc in Heidelberg and later in Cambridge, you mentioned the differences in teaching styles between German and British universities. Uh, how did these experiences shape your approach to teaching and research? Yeah, so my, uh, my second postdoc was perhaps more of, a, of an assistant uh, professorship. So that would be uh, comparable to a lecturer here in the UK. Um, so then, of course, I also had the opportunity to teach my own courses, including such courses like uh, statistical physics or particle physics or particle physics itself. And um, yeah, then, of course, after coming here, um, I saw not only the PhD level teaching that I saw as, my, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a PhD student, but also, um, let's say, the undergraduate teaching that you would normally do as a professor. As I mentioned earlier, I now regularly do with electromagnetism, of course, among other things, which is quite enjoyable because you get to see the full cohort of about 180 students. Um, so yeah, um, compared to, uh, to before, I would say um, Cambridge is quite interesting. Um, as an environment for teaching, because um, while in, in, in Germany you would have perhaps more of a mixture of very strong students 
and, and perhaps not so strong students. Here in Cambridge, they're all handpicked. So all of them, <laughs> uh, they, they kind of uh, work together and um, there is a certain microclimate in the lecture, uh, in the lecture hall. Um, and despite teaching the subject already for years, I have to admit, every year, every cohort manages to ask me a couple of questions where I have to pause for a second before I can give them an answer because that's a new question that was not asked before. So you have to... Uh, keeping <laughs> you a, on your toes. Yeah, as... yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Sometimes I also have to admit that, you know, my first reaction or my first intuition about uh, how to answer this question is this and that, but actually let me go back and confirm this. Uh, yeah, and then of course I have to go back and do my homework and provide them the, <laughs> the real answer, which sometimes deviates from a first intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Did the spirit of your sixth form teacher influence your teaching style at all? Um, yes, of course. Um, I think part of the teaching is not only explaining concepts, but also to instill passion for what you're doing. And... Um, what is particularly important at university is that not only do we teach future, um, the, the, the future uh, of, academ of academia or people who will work for industry, but also we teach future, future teachers. Mm. So these will be people who will be going to the classroom, each of them faced with 20, 30 kids. And it's up to them to instill the spark for science or knowledge in this following generations. And of course, the very first step for this to ha has to happen already at this stage when we are educating them at university so that they see that this is something valuable that they really ought to pass on. Um, and in this spirit, um, I tried to um, remodel the electromagnetism lecture by introducing about 30 experimental demonstrations where I just uh, take a break from the lecture for about five minutes and I show um, and I show a, uh, a demonstration of an experiment that underlines or um, uh, perhaps displays some of the concepts that uh, we are currently discussing in the lecture. Uh, precisely with the idea that uh, students are encouraged to perhaps uh, try this out themselves when they will be teaching the subject or um, just, you know, to have fun and to train, uh, train the intuition. I would normally do the demonstration before doing the demonstration and explaining the setup, I would ask the students, what is your expectation? What does the intuition tell you will happen? And only then do the demonstration and then have, of course, a second discussion of what has actually happened and how we can understand it from a physics perspective. I think this is very valuable. It sounds fun as well. <laughs> Definitely. I'd do that. <laughs> um, so let's go back to particle physics. Um, so it, this is about searching for new physics and more often than not, not finding it. Um, how would you say your frustration compares to your fulfillment when it comes to your research? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't think that I'm really frustrated by a negative result if you're searching for something, because a negative result is also a result. It tells you how new physics does not look like. So it is, it is a valuable piece of knowledge. And as the LHC keeps operating, and I should remind everybody that at, the, at this point in time, we have collected only about 5 to 10% of the future data that will be collected in the following years after the upgrade of the, luminosity, of the Large Hadron Collider to the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider. Um, of course, we discover new things as we go along. In, in, at the moment, these are mostly negative <laughs> discoveries. So mm. we discover how new physics does not look like. There's, of course, also a couple of discoveries. Uh, the most important one of them being, of course, the discovery of the Higgs boson. Then, of course, uh, Quarkonia that is now uh, being studied at uh, the uh, LHCb experiment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we did discover some phenomena, but of course, the big breakthrough, like, for example, finding experimental evidence uh, for the particle nature of dark matter, that's something that uh, we are still working hard on. But so it's um, not a frustration? It's not a frustration. I think the main frustration or the main points in frustra of frustration for me are perhaps um, in the everyday lab life. <laughs> <laughs> for example, if you are trying to, uh, to measure something with your... Um, 
whether your setup where you're trying to develop the next generation of detectors and you see, oh, I have a noise issue. There is noise, electronics noise, which is just spoiling my measurement. I can't really get a clean measurement. So you have to go back to the drawing board pretty much and think very carefully about your, how you, how you, the wiring of your setup and then go through the individual pieces bit by bit and diagnosing them potentially with an oscilloscope and all that. That can be frustrating because mm-hmm. this can take a lot of time. You also learn valuable things. Uh, and of course, the frustration afterwards uh, turns into a very positive experience because after you've invested yourself, your energy into uh, finding a solution to a problem, um, the fruit of harvesting of harvesting this, uh, this result that you want to obtain is just so much more sweeter. Um, yeah. Uh, for data analysis, that's also the same. Sometimes you want to measure something, so you have a problem that you would like to address. And you think, okay, I could use uh, this and that methodology to do that. And you try, you try this out, you set up the, the data analysis code, etc., etc. And you realize, oh, it doesn't actually work so well. Or there's perhaps this uncertainty I didn't anticipate that would arise. Or somebody else tells you, oh, did you think about it? And then you go, ah, I should have thought about it. And then you have to change the methodology. Of course, this is very frustrating because this can mean that you can work for a week or maybe a month or maybe half a year for the paper basket. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that's also part of life because it teaches you something. And uh, Mm -hmm. in the end, it just makes the the fruit that you harvest at the end uh, sweeter. Good. But so would you say that your um, your research still feed your like continues to feed your curiosity and you like yeah. absolutely absolutely i, th- I uh, some, sometimes i have the impression i still continue playing <laughs> as i was playing the sandbox you tr- you go from one problem to the next and you try to solve them and address them sometimes you fail sometimes you fail again you fail better you feel you fail better every time until you succeed <laughs> Now, you talked a little bit about uh, how fundamental particle physics is and how you could derive everything from it. But uh, what, to, what about to non-physicists, to people for whom the, uh, the standard model is just sort of two pages of hieroglyphs? How would you explain what you do to them and what you're trying to uncover? <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, I think I would, at, at the very first, uh, at the outset of this discussion, I would just preface this by reminding them precisely of the fact that uh, the standard model, which is the foundation of particle physics, um, is capable of explaining pretty much most of the fun of the phenomena that you observe in everyday life <laughs> and this can be described in terms of uh, mathematical formalism um, which is a locally gauge invariant um, uh, quantum field theory <laughs> um, However, without going into further details, I would uh, then also mention that there are very fundamental questions that the standard model does not address. One of them is why we're here. So we know (laughs) from particle physics, from standard model, that matter and antimatter annihilate into nothing and energy when they meet each other. However, obviously we exist and our universe is mostly made up of matter. According to our best knowledge as of today, <laughs> in the Big Bang, equal proportions of matter and antimatter were produced, but then clearly some uh, excess matter has remained. This is what we are made of, and this question we still don't understand today. Another fundamental uh, question that's something that's uh, at, the, at the core of my research um, in the last few years, this is the riddle of dark matter. So we know that dark matter exists. It's five times more abundant than regular visible matter that we are familiar with. So this planet, the stars, everything that you can observe um, when you um, when you look at the night sky, uh, the night sky, possibly even with a telescope, uh, we still know that this is just one fifth of the total matter in the universe. Um, Plus, there is also such a thing like dark energy, which we don't understand at all. We just know it's there. (laughs) And of that, we have even more in the total energy balance than dark matter. So, yeah, um, what what I'm mostly interested in is, uh, let's say, the easy of the two problems, the dark matter question. (laughs) (laughs) Dark energy is really quite difficult even to frame properly. so yeah, this is uh, this is what we are doing with uh, with my research group. Um, we are looking for dark matter using, um, let's say, a rather exotic signature where um, 
we are producing particles um, at the Large Hadron Collider, particles that we don't know that belong to the dark sector, which also contains the dark matter particle. And so these newly produced, freshly produced particles, they exist for a macroscopic amount of time so that they travel away from the production point some measurable distance, at which point they decay into um, particles from the standard model that we know that we can measure, and then of course the dark matter particle. So this gives you quite a striking signature because what you see in your detector is that nothing has been produced, so you see nothing, 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 <laughs> nothing, nothing, and then suddenly you see this decay vertex from this um, dark sector particle that has decayed into standard model particles and dark matter particle. The dark matter particle, of course, you cannot measure, but in the standard model particles you can measure and you can start the displaced vertex from it. So this is uh, what we are trying to explore at the moment at the Large Hadron Collider, and this is also what we are trying to, to prepare um, at the high luminosity Large Hadron Collider after the upgrade. So there is a new detector that we proposed, and at the moment we are doing the um, research and design of the detector components to actually realize uh, this this proposal. Thanks. But it sounds very similar to old Chantwick's discovery of the neutron about 100 years ago, uh, just <laughs> seeing nothing and then particles you did understand were from it. That's a very good parallel. <laughs> now, you said uh, another way of explaining what you do is to say so that you continue to play. This is quite a stimulating way of looking at things. I mean, could you expand on this? Do you think science should be a game? <laughs> well, certainly not the Game of Thrones, <laughs> but uh, part of a game is that you're trying to to try something out. Yeah, so you have a hypothesis. For example, a hypothesis that we are currently testing is that dark matter is that there is not just a dark matter particle, but it's actually part of a more extensive dark sector which comprises several particles, um, which then can decay into one another. And so this uh, defines then a new signature, which is such a displaced vertex, as I was explaining earlier. And this is a hypothesis you can test. There are very many ways you can go about it. And of course, every physicist will have their own uh, reference. So uh, we are trying our, uh, our ideas. Um, and this is not only this big idea, but of course, small ideas on a daily basis. Yeah. So for example, how do you reconstruct such a displaced vertex? Which algorithms do you use for this? What is better? How do we optimize it? Here it performs quite badly. Can we improve it? So it's, it's really a continuous, uh, um, well, let's say, yeah, playing in the sense of tweaking, improving, and trying to find uh, constant new solutions. And I think this is really at the basis of, um, or very closely connected to the natural curiosity of us humans. Mm. Now, I think that sort of natural curiosity, that investigative approach, is something that often gets forgotten, particularly when you sort of think of scientists struggling away. But yeah, you think back to the discovery of graphene. That was a wasn't it a Wednesday afternoon t group meeting where they got to play around with the kit. <laughs> it's the same group where they levitated frogs inside a, uh, a superconducting magnet, and then later on they created graphene with two sheets of gaffer tape. I think Poor it, frogs. <laughs> <laughs> the frogs were fine apparently. They yeah. they lived out a happy life in the uh, <laughs> department where they were borrowed from. I don't know about the strawberries. I imagine they didn't live as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's um, we're almost tempted to finish on this high note of playing and like keeping the fun um, into the physics, but uh, we have one more question for you. Um, what advice would you give to a young person considering a career in physics based on your own journey and your own experience? Good. I think the primary piece of advice would be have fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a it's a long journey, right? It's a laborious journey. It's only worth it if you're having fun while you're walking it. Of course, you will not have fun all the time, right? There will be phases where, as I was mentioning, you're literally working for the paper basket. Or perhaps where you think, oh, I want to do this type of physics. And in the end, you realize, mm, maybe that's not such a good idea unless I switch universities hmm. um, that you're perhaps not quite prepared to do. Or perhaps you're so frustrated that you want to become a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the end, uh, I think this is, this is perhaps the second piece of advice. Um, yeah, just have fun. As I said, that's the first one. The second one is uh, um, you should perhaps be frustration tolerant because, of course, science and research is full of setbacks. You try things out, they don't work. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's uh, how it normally goes, more often than not. So, if that's not something for you, then perhaps uh, one should pick a different career. And I'm not saying this uh, um, in uh, in an offensive way. It's just you know not not for you. And simple as that. Um, yeah, and like I said, have fun and uh, also don't overthink it because uh, in the end, all the dots above the eyes they are set after the eyes after the text is written, right? So there is no point of overthinking and outlining your future career. It will just evolve by itself. Mm. The most important thing is that you have fun. If you have fun, you will deliver. You will deliver, deliver great results. Because you're delivering great results, you'll have even more fun. <laughs> so it will become a sort of perpetual uh, cycle. And uh, to some extent, it probably doesn't really matter what exactly you do, as long as you enjoy doing it and as long as you do research that's uh, relevant for for us as, as a society fantastic great advice for everyone <laughs> out there um up and onwards um thank you very much oleg for your time today that was great thank you for having me So uh, thank you, Oleg Grant, for joining us today. As always, if you'd like to learn more about what we discussed in this episode and more generally about our work at the Cambridge Laboratory, please have a look at the show notes or go to our website, www.phy.cam.ac.uk. If you have any questions you would like to ask our physicists, head to social media and tag us with the hashtag, hashtag people doing physics. This episode was recorded and edited by Chris Brock. Thank you for listening to People Doing Physics, and we'll be back next month.